welcome to Perspectives on Energy on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about electric bikes and their impact on the grid. E-bikes need charging, too, you know. Our guest for the show is Guillermo Sabache, who is with Industrial Skills of HSI. Welcome to the show, Guillermo. Hi, hello, Jay, and thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to be here. You had a presentation about this, about electric bikes and their impact on the grid. Why don't you go into that presentation and help us understand? Of course. Well, this is a, I'll start off with a slight review of some previous shows, but mostly we're talking about what the grid looks like of the future, which really the future is almost here, right? Mostly here. And you can see on that screen on the on the on the right, where a lot of these different green, green, green circles really indicate the fact that you're having additional resources out there where it's like uh either batteries or storage or different types of load, right? So in the past, I've talked a lot about electric vehicles and what the impact is on the grid and what we're looking at. Also talked about batteries and you talked about what the renewable resources do to the grid. And in some cases, they enhance it. In other cases, they, they have a strange impact on load, right? Well, now we're looking at another element of potentially energy storage slash loading on, on the grid, and that is electric bikes, right? Now, <clears throat> I'm sure I saw, I've shown you this graph in the past, right, where we have, for example, this, this dog curve where we see what happens between the hours of 10 and 4, where uh, as the solar panels they you know, begin to produce enough power with the sunlight, right, that that load curve kind of drops off because, you know, it sees it as, as, as negative load. And that has been somewhat offset now because of the energy storage and batteries whether it's utility scale solar or the planned charging of electric vehicles. As we get more and more of them on the road and in different households, the way they charge is going to be managed, hopefully at either the most convenient times for the utilities, which is usually off peak periods. Now, at some point, we're gonna see them become very useful as a distributed energy resource, but you know we're still working out the kinks for that when it comes to utility scale service, right? But keep in mind, those will be called distributor energy resources, and those are electric vehicles. This is another example of what it looks like, right? Over time, when you only look at solar, solar and wind, and the impact that has, right, during most utility uh, load curves during the day, right? And this is what you see happening. For example, now it's it's this. Uh, eventually, prices become negative, and that's usually has an impact with renewable resources. Well, now, when you begin to charge electric vehicles and hopefully bikes at this time, then that severe drop in that curve should be offset and should be brought up some more again, thereby keeping, you know, making good use of that extra generation. Sounds like a great idea, right, in this case. So, and how could this be possible, right? Well, according to the Department of Energy, DOE, the number of bikes sold year over year uh, as you can see, for example, pandemic, uh, they, they almost doubled from 2019, right? And then when you're looking at, oops, when you're looking at, so, so 2020, there was a big surge in the number of e-bikes sold. And I'm talking about, you know, uh, somehow right under 500,000 bikes in the U.S. 2021, that more than doubled. We're looking at almost like uh, 900, 850,000 bikes sold. 2022, you're looking at well over a million. Right, and this is already two years ago, and from what I've seen out on the road, my own personal experience and my own um, what's that word that academics like to use, for example, uh, uh, anecdotal evidence. Right, uh, I'm seeing way more of that. So much so that every single Department of Wildlife Resources, every single DOT uh, Department of Transportation, every single Department of Motor Vehicles is now putting together rules regarding you know their safe use and their restrictions in some cases, right? Some of these bikes can easily cat and drive off to 55 miles per hour, right? Especially some of these powerful motors. At the same time, in places like New York, they began to outlaw certain bikes because of the fact that they've caused some severe building fires. And that has a whole set of like uh, complications, legal complications with, with, with the state, the city, and even and even that, that, that municipality. Because of the fact that th those batteries are, are uh, whether they're damaged, they've been overused, or being improperly charged, 
can can have what they call a a runaway reaction, and then you have a very 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 nasty fire that can burn down buildings. Right? And so some lives have been lost. But that aside, right, the fact of the matter is that they're becoming a very popular choice for people to uh, to commute. Or in New York, for example, they're using for delivery. They're they're using that for like uh, what used to be before the the, the typical. Uh, process server, the, the typical, for example, runner, now it's being done by e-bikes, and, and now everybody has access to that. At the same time, for example, they, they sell cargo bikes. So what is it, right? So it's a, it's a, it looks like a regular bicycle, but now you're adding like a, a battery, right, as you can see here. And uh, so this battery, in this case, right, is frame, it's mounted on the frame. You have different varieties, right? You have some controllers. In some cases, the motor is back here on the hub. In other cases, the motor is up here in the in the uh, in, with a crankcase, which makes use of the, the gearing. Right. Either way, you know, you're, you're going to have a controller, you're going to have a throttle in some cases, and you're going to have, for example, the battery. Right? The battery itself is what really is a point of focus here because of the fact that that battery requires quite a bit of energy to charge. Usually, talking about two to three amps for maybe three to two to three or four hours in some cases to fully charge a battery. Right. The other issue you have is quality, where uh, buying good quality cells, a good battery could run you five, six hundred dollars. Cheaper batteries will run you about maybe two hundred to three hundred dollars, but there lies the problem. You run the risk of having an incident with a fire. So that's another interesting problem, right? And different states have a bunch of different legal definitions, but for the most part, most of them are sticking with the different three classes of e-bikes, right? In most states, like for example, in Virginia, you can use a class two bike on public lands. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that you have what they call pedal assist, which means the motor helps push you as you're pedaling, so it's assisting you, or you have a full throttle where you can just you know, use that and you can just basically just sit there with your legs not moving and you let the bike do all the work, right? That's a throttle. Class two and a class two has usually a limit of 750 watts, which is really about one horsepower. Class one, right? And that's right now in Florida and public lands. That one is everything. Everything a class two is minus the throttle. You're not allowed to have a throttle in Florida now, currently on public lands. So that's what's different. And then a class three, you really. Oh, by the way, both class one and class two have a speed limit, and that speed limit is 20 miles per hour. Class three is like a class one, but the speed limit is 28 miles per hour. So the point is that people are getting into these different bikes, uh, depending on what they can afford. Some of them can cost $600 new, others can go as high as $6,000, which I've seen, them, right? And I've seen a lot of like people that are doing the outdoors, like hunters and fish and, and anglers, and people that like to do, for example, backcountry camping on the bikes, where well, they go out there. A lot of hunters are using them now. And in most cases, right, they're using them where they were not allowed to use uh, gasoline-powered uh, ATVs or or side by sides or other vehicles, whereas the bike is being treated just like you can use a regular mountain bike. So the benefit there is people that normally were 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 up in age or they had some kind of like a disability or some kind of a physical limitation. I myself, you know, getting to that age where we're sometimes carrying a pack and that sort of thing when I'm out in the woods and trying to get out carrying something really, really heavy, if you got lucky, then you know, you're know you gonna make two trips easily. Well, with the bike, you can then load up a trailer and load up what you need, and then you, you can ride out the same day and probably go a lot deeper, right? So the example here, right, of what bikes are not is is that they're, what, what they don't want you doing is, is using something as greater than 750 watts, and they wanna make sure you have pedals because it is a bike after all, and they, have a, they usually have a speed limitation of 20 miles per hour. It, most places have a have a limitation of you can't use a class three anymore, but th again, it varies state by state, and uh, there it'll be interesting how when they get to that point where they make a nationwide nationwide um, ruling, right? So again, some of the basic things, but the important thing again is the actual battery. Some of them have a motor in the middle, like I said earlier. They have a throttle, they have a controller, and but for the most part, it's just a regular regular looking bike, right? Uh, some of them are heavier and thicker than the others. One important thing I wanted to point out, and this is where I got these uh, these different slides from, is that every state now, including, I believe the IRS, already has a credit 
for new bikes purchased in 2024. And it is, it is a 30% purchase credit. So you buy a bike for $1,000, you can get $300 back. Certain states also have those incentives. And I think almost pretty much every state has one now. So what does this do? What does this do to us as a, as a from my perspective, right, as a grid, right? A lot of people are going to start buying bikes. A lot of people in urban areas. For example, you're seeing... Um, I, I was in Denver not long ago, and I and they had a they had a pretty well defined bike lane pretty much everywhere in downtown urban Denver, and a lot of people were on. I saw a lot of bikes being used. A lot of places to actually park your bike, secure it with a good you know cable lock and or like those 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 chains, and in some places they even have places to actually charge your bike, right? So. Ultimately, it's. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of these. Uh, there's a lot more people buying e-bikes than they are buying EVs. Mind you, the density of and capacity of an e-bike battery is nowhere near the capacity of a car. But eventually, when you have enough bikes, you're going to have some kind of equivalency there when it comes to the uh, the charging load you're going to have out there. So, so, so Jay, you mentioned you were looking at e-bikes or doing some research on them a while back. Tell me more about that. Um, I have some gadfly concerns about e-bikes, mm -hmm. and you can help me with that. Of course. Number one is the infrastructure mm. that is in most cities doesn't include bike lanes that will accommodate e-bikes. Right. And uh, 20 miles an hour or even 28 miles an hour may not be enough to keep up with traffic. Right. And that makes it very dangerous. And if they if they take a, a, a an old-fashioned classical bike lane, that may not work because there aren't that many bike lanes. And I wonder what happens if they take it on a walking path. Would that be legal? Would it be legal everywhere? So you you have this kind of um, disconnect mm -hmm. between this particular mode of transportation and regular vehicular transportation and the infrastructure and the walking paths. Right. Where do they go? Where are they safe? How do I avoid going to the hospital? And that is the other challenge. Uh, according to the journal, American the Journal of, of uh, the, the JAMA, they that is one of the fastest uh, fastest increasing types of injuries out there now. People on e-bikes get you know ha having some pretty bad spills. And the problem is, is that a lot of them are riding them on pavement. They're riding them on with flip flops, uh, maybe a helmet. But I mean, you know, if you if you're if you're riding a bike. That that's it's got so much mass, you're going to be riding a lot faster. So it, even if you don't have anybody else, you just end up falling and you and you land on the pavement, your injury is going to be far worse than you just fell off like a regular ten speed or a mountain bike. Just just because of the speed and the inertia and the mass. The other challenge there, of course, is the fact that not everybody has clear rulings, right, on how to use them. So so and which I think is appropriate to what that particular city or that particular area has to deal with. Um, what I've noticed in most places, they're treating them like they treat any other bikes, which is fine because, you know, I've been on, 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 on dirt trails that have pedestrian foot traffic, bikers, but they also share that with regular mountain bikers. And those mountain bikers are flying down those trails, right? Whereas an e-bike, you know, may barely keep up with the fact that, would, or, or maybe be at the same speed because they they are limited to 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 that velocity. But at the same time, getting hit by a regular mountain bike versus getting hit by an e-bike, you know, may may be a little different. Now, I personally don't like don't like riding my e-bike on, on on public roads. I don't like I don't like riding them on places where you have um, foot traffic or even other bikes. I like sticking to mine basically on off-road trails, which is what I use it for. But again. I am not the majority of e-bike users, right? So no, you're you're trained, you're you uh, you're trained, you're experienced, and uh, my understanding is you don't have to have a license for this. It's treated as a bicycle in terms right. of training and licensing. So if I'm uh, some some kid, some adolescent who has one of these things, who got it for his birthday or Christmas mm -hmm. or what have you, and I'm out there, I can pretty much go anywhere I I want. Um, but right. I am not licensed to deal with traffic, which right. makes it more dangerous from that point of view. Uh, I'm, I would be very concerned that 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 leads to your AMA stat right. on people getting injured because they have no clue on how to drive. 
And not, and not to mention the fact that that uh, motorists don't may not may not see them because if, if you're pulling out of a parking a parking lot, going going over that swale into into that ramp to get into into the traffic, well, you know you may not see that bike coming or the bike's coming too fast, right? So you end up hitting them or they hit you, and that's where some accidents happen. So so that's the other challenge now now. It was nice when I saw it in certain cities like Denver, but when I went to California, there's no such thing in some places, right? There's just no such thing as a bike path. When I went to when in Florida, they and where I used to live before, they had a very nice, nicely developed bike path, but that bike path was wide enough for pedestrians and bikes. The problem is that those pedestrians meander all over the place. So you got you got some lady on the far right with her dog on the leash on the far left. And then you are you don't see a leash sometimes if you're going fast enough, right? So that's the other challenge. There's also there's also a level of resentment. And I, I can no. tell you, you know, I, I used to ride bike a lot. Mm -hmm. um, bike, ordinary, classical, old-fashioned bike. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. It's a, it's a graduated experience. But um, you know, what, what I found was there were people on the road. And this includes, this includes cars and drivers. It mm -hmm. also includes pedestrians. Who had a resentment about bikes? Right. You know, you, you know, you would be riding next to them, and they would give you the finger. Um, they yeah. would yell epithets out the window. Uh, they would shake their fist at you. And I, what, what is all that about? Now, you know, I suppose there's some defense of that if you're having an e-bike because because it's um, it's automated. It's an e-bike, but if you have a classical bike and they do that to you, what they're really saying is. Um, you know, they look down on all kinds of bicycle, two-wheel vehicles. And I think that probably goes further to include e-bikes. And so you have a public education question. Um, you have an attitudinal societal question. Mm -hmm. And if these are going to be accepted uh, on a long-term basis, people have to get used to them, appreciate them, uh, just as they should get used to and appreciate classical bikes. Right. Well, and. You're seeing that as well on electric vehicles, right? Like, for example, my wife drives like a little tiny Tesla 3. And that car is nice to drive. It's zippy. It's very sporty. But, man, you get some harassment on the road, right, uh, even up here where I'm at. And it's interesting because of the fact that they'll tailgate you. Now, I drive my my lifted SUV, and nobody bothers me. But but when I drive, for example, the, the Tesla, that then in some parts of the state, and, you know, and I've seen that happen in different states, right? But, like... They harass you. Now we've got a friend who has a brand new cyber truck. And a cyber truck now confuses people, right? You get a lot of hate, you get a lot of love, and then you get a lot of confused looks and you get a lot of curiosity. But at the same time, right? It's it's there's a whole weird emotional reaction to those particular vehicles. Now with an e-bike, when you're on a on, on a trail that's mostly for mountain bikes. You get people really, really angrily defensive about their, for example, you, you know, you haven't earned the right to be on this trail because you're not, you know, you're using an e-bike. Well, 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 you know, I'm like, hey, what if I have a knee replacement? What's your, and then, and then, for example, the fact that you're allowed to be there legally, you quote them the rules. I was like, well, you know what, I, I'm allowed to be here legally. Go pound sand, and then, and then, but you know, there, 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 there have been cases where there, there have been, you know, altercations, right? But at that point, you call the the Forest Service, you call the Department of Wildlife Resources, or the Park Ranger, or even, for example, um, Wildlife Management, and they will usually uh, handle it. What I have noticed, though, is that they will get far more severe on those harassers if it involves a hunter. If a hunter is being harassed, the penalty to the harasser is far more severe because it, it's actually <laughs> a statute. It actually is. It's a, it's a statute. So if you go hunting and you're getting there, there's a rules of hunter harassment, right? So if, you, if you're, you're a hunter, you're getting harassed. They're getting far. They will, they will get in far more trouble if, than if you're just out there uh, mountain biking. You know, so it's interesting. So, you know, uh, when you're on a bike, whether it's a classical bike or an e-bike, you're exposed. You're vulnerable to somebody who wants to harass you, oh, yeah. especially in a in a remote location on a on a hiking trail or a bike trail. And all he has to do is push you. Just push right. you. So you lose balance, and that's so for all kinds of bikes. You lose balance, and you really get hurt. And uh, there's some there's something really evil about that because the guy who does that knows you're going to get hurt. 
I don't I don't know what could be done about that, but it's infuriating to think that people would do that intentionally. Oh my God, it, it's I I I got stories like like it's not just e bikes. There are some public lands where. Some people go far enough in that they feel that they've that that's wrong, but it is public land, so anybody can be there. But they but they get so angry at uh, there was a, there was an area that allowed dirt bikes, regular internal combustion engine dirt bikes, and what they would do is that they would stretch a cable across across the trail. So as you're riding, a cable is going to hit you either you know it, it, that could kill somebody, right? Yes. They, they they would stretch this cable out, right? And then some people people would hit that and fall off the bike and that sort of thing. But they they've in some cases have begun doing that as well in trails that that are, are being frequented by e-bikers. Now the e-biker is not going fast. If you're riding, if you're riding off-road, you're you're doing maybe seven to eight miles per seven, eight miles per hour. That's as fast as I dare to go. And I'm pretty daring, but so because you know, you really can't see that well uh when you're when you're going through through those 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 bushes or that tight little like you know if you're if you're in a ro remote location and for some reason bike start stops working oh uh, oh it's run out of, you run out of a uh, charge in the battery uh something goes wrong on the you know the right uh equipment and now and now you have a bike that is not it's not being you know it's not an e-bike anymore at right. best it's a regular bike so the question, and you may have had this experience, Guillermo. Mm -hmm. The question is, if it stops working, can you still use it as a pedal bike? Is that universal, or is that only in some cases? Yes, you can still use it as a pedal bike. The problem is that it is a far heavier bike. Now, you can pedal the, the bike if you're on a nice gravel trail, but if you're riding it off-road for real, it's going to be a hard bike to push, right? Especially when you're gone up and down hills. Now, for me, I always keep an eye on my charge. I keep I kind of plan my route where I'm gonna go. So so I'll know, hey, going up this hill, I'm gonna eat up a lot of my charge. And I make sure I save that for, for the way back. But then I also I also have a spare battery. I, I always carry a spare battery with uh on a on a cargo tray and then and then that sort of thing. Now now I, I've had malfunctions, right? Where like I've snapped the chain or I had, for example, some 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 so connections, you know, get get damaged where I have to go in there and fix them in the field. I've even had it where the bike got 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 like uh, flooded, where I completely floored. Of course, I got it completely in the water, and that it it didn't damage it, but the, the bike decided to stop working until it dried out. So I had to like pull it out of the water and keep you know, and 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 uh, push it and then ride it like a regular bike for maybe a couple of miles until it finally dried off and I was able to do it. But that's risky because you can start a fire with the battery, right? So things like those, right? And and um, and, and that's always been a concern, right? Because of the fact that yeah, you're, you're doing it to get out there to 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 go in far deeper than you could on foot, and way deeper than you know than of course than you could on a regular bike. But now you've you've put yourself in a position where you may not be able to walk back even if you had to, and that's where it gets really like um, understanding where you're at, and so and of course always. Telling somebody where, where where you are and contact information, and then in some cases you may not even have cell phone service, which is why it's always important to tell somebody where you're going to be if you're out in the woods, right? What about insurance, Guillermo? Um, insurance against uh, hitting somebody with the bike, insurance against losing the bike, um, or theft, or, bike theft, theft, or, theft, theft or theft. Yeah, it's really, it's very, very, very common. So. Uh, Geico and a few other carriers already offer insurance for e-bikes. I mean, some of these are you know several thousand dollars, right? And and they offer that. Uh, they also offer some liability if you run somebody over, for example, that sort of thing. But uh, it's not expensive yet. I'm sure it's gonna get more and more expensive, and I'm sure they charge you a premium if you're you know under a certain age, right? Uh, the thing is, if you're riding the bike off road and not really on bike trails, what I've noticed is that is that they tend to charge me a little less than, I'm, than if I'm commuting with it. So if I'm commuting with the bike, it's one of the questions they ask is the fact that, okay, then you're at a higher risk of having a collision with somebody else or more liability. If you're off in the woods and you just kind of like, you know, hurt yourself, well, you know, it's, you're just dealing with a damaged bike and maybe some bodily injury, which, you know, your your typical health insurance recovers. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have one other thing I, I'd like to return with you to mm -hmm. the grid issue, okay? Yes. Um, back in the, um, I would say it was in the 90s, um, there was a guy who came to town in Honolulu. He was an Israeli, ran a company called Better Place. 
Mm-hmm. And a better place was um, a kind of a um, collaboration between his Israeli company and Siemens in Germany. Okay. <clears throat> and their mission was to do exactly what you mentioned at the very beginning of the show. That is, create distributed resources Mm -hmm. with electric vehicles so that when you went home um, after a day of driving around and you plugged into your house, it would actually feed um, energy into the grid once it was topped off. And his idea, which I thought was way ahead of its time, um, is that the utility, in this case, Hawaiian Electric, would have a facility. Uh, that would be able to control all of this distributed energy coming in from all of these electric vehicles. Right. It never really got off the ground. I mean, it was interesting. He had several presentations about it, I recall. Um, and then he was a very affable guy, so everybody liked what he was saying. But ultimately, he needed city approval for this, mm-hmm. I guess, uh, or utility approval, and he couldn't get it in enough cities. So the company folded, and it was all over within a few years. But the idea, you know, is still a possibility. And you were saying at the beginning of the show that um, maybe we have work to do, but ultimately all electric vehicles, including, you know, car electric vehicles and truck electric vehicles Mm -hmm. and bike electric vehicles can be distributed resources. Um, But we had some work to do. What is the work we have to do? Well, somebody is already ahead of that. So in New York, for example, they're looking at setting up charging hubs for these bikes, or at least the batteries, right? Because really, that's the problem. And uh, the, the battery, once you take the battery off the bike, the bike's light, and you can just pretty much put it in your apartment and you're fine. But the batteries was really expensive, and this was dense, and this was dangerous. So what they've done is that they created like a battery charging hub, right? And what you do is, it's like a little locker, put your battery in there, plug it in, close it up, and that, that locker is like a fireproof spot, and you're paying for that, that service, right? At the same time, right, they can kind of control what kind of charge they're doing over what time. And then at some point, they can say, hey, let's use this to kind of power certain things. You get into those agreements. So there you have that possibility of getting into those agreements where you can charge it, but then if you're not going to need it, hey, can we use 10% of your charge? And I'm sure the app will ask you, right, hey, we're about to black out. Can we, can we use some of your power? And when they have enough of those battery charging hubs, right, it, then it becomes the equivalent of a couple of EVs, right? Because an EV, it's it's it maybe it's maybe looking like at, I'll say like maybe thirty or forty of these e-bike batteries, right? A, a small EV, but it's still uh, there are enough bikes out there to kind of make up you know many of these cars, car batteries. So so ultimately, I think we're going to get there. Also, the fact of the matter is that a battery charging hub is far safer than charging bikes in an apartment building. Because oh, if, sure. you have a, if you have a fire, that fire may be contained to, to, to just that one locker, or maybe it may it may just you know expel that battery and save save the others. But either way, there's a precaution to you know in place to you know keep the, the, the that battery or that battery hub from burning down a whole building, right? So that's kind of what we're looking at here, and and I think we're going to be seeing more of that, and especially in these in these very dense urban areas where you have that fire risk. The batteries do pose a severe fire risk. And as they get older and you charge them and discharge them more times, you will approach that point where the battery is going to fail. And usually you want to get rid of that before that happens, right? So So how can you tell when it's failing? How can you tell when your fire risk is greater? And one other aspect of that is that I understand that an electric fire is harder to put out how how can you be prepared to put it out so your right. your building won't burn down? Right, and that's and that's the, the the big tough issue there, right? Because the fact of the matter is, most people are are not going to want to spend money on a good quality like a Panasonic or a Samsung or a Sony, right? Uh, set of batteries, and all these batteries pretty much you use the same cells that are being used in the e bikes. It's it's a one eighty six seventy um. um uh, battery, which you, you found in most laptops, right? And, and so so these typical battery cells are, they, they just keep adding a lot of them together, right? Which is a great design. But but the way you can tell is that over time, the battery has less and less of a charge and less and less of a range. Even though it's you've charged it fully, you don't get much range out of it. And that way, that there you know the battery has been, been degrading and degrading over time. Um, a lot of these batteries have uh, and 
a controller or, or like an energy management system that pretty much the better ones that pretty much be, begin to warn you ahead of time hey this battery is losing its it, it, you're down to like 70 you know capacity so one of the key indicators is capacity the other one is the ability for it to deliver power so those and then of course you have diagnostics on the bike the better ones that'll basically tell you your battery is kind of you know it's it's, it's getting old and not to mention the fact that you know after a certain number of miles, you you also know like an e like a battery on, on an EV, right? After a certain number of miles, those batteries are starting to have issues, right? So uh, and then I don't remember your, your second question, uh, but the fire. Okay, so so usually the the best preventative to that is kind of like have the battery in a secure fi fireproof or fire resistant container. Or just keep it outside the house. I mean, I base I personally charge my batteries inside the barbecue grill, just in case. <laughs> yeah. But you don't you don't want to turn on the grill while you're charging them. <laughs> no, but 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 I keep it in the shade. I charge it, and and then I wait, right? And then I I do a slow trickle charge using a smart charger. And once the battery is is finally charged, then I kind of very baby it and I put it put it away in the garage, right, in its own container. And that way, I just said, wait. Now, I got quality batteries, but I have had some cheap batteries that, and I've seen where uh, one time the battery just decided I, I drained the battery all the way to zero, which you're not supposed to do. And that's that was the end of the battery, right? So I can no longer charge it. So I just keep it stored. Like, the other issue is disposing it, right? Uh, nobody wants to take a cheap battery and dispose of it or recycle it. So now I'm stuck with it. What do you think of the other issue? So. so if I go to Europe, if I if I have gone, to, and I have uh, to Europe and look around about bicycles. Mm -hmm. uh, I see a lot more people, you know, riding bicycles all over Europe than in the U.S. I mean, we have sort of um, abandoned the notion of, yeah. you know, using bicycles to commute and the like. And in city, in cities, do not plan for bicycles very much. In Europe, they do. Mm -hmm. It's um, and it's more accepted and so forth. But I really wonder globally. This trend, this movement you're talking about, um, this increase in interest in e-bikes, uh, whether it exists elsewhere outside the U.S., whether it exists in Europe or in China. And a footnote to that is in 2004, I went to uh, Beijing. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days, it was much friendlier with China. And a friend of mine, who was an American, took me to a big uh, department store. It was actually a French department store. Uh, in Beijing, and in that store, they had electric bikes. They had, they had a million of them. Okay. Wow. And he says to me, he says to me, let's take a ride on the electric bikes. I said, what do you mean? We're in the middle of a huge department store, <laughs> and the salesman. And this is this is China. And the salesman in the department says, no, no, you can do that. Let's all do that. So. <laughs> The aisles were wide, and there we were, the three of us riding around on electric bikes through through this Chinese department store. I'll never forget that. But they're very popular in China. You know, nine million bicycles in Beijing was a song. Remember the song? Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's you know, it's although they still have uh, bicycles, of course, they have a lot of cars, too. But the bottom line is that China has a lot of electric vehicles, electric bikes, and they make, a, what is it called, a BYD, I think it's called? This really good electric car now, mm -hmm. so they're into this, and I su I suggest the that that even if Europe is not on board with this movement, this trend, China certainly is. Oh, so yeah. your thoughts about the global the global prospects? Well, I think I uh, a, lot, a lot of a lot of my friends have gone to Europe, and they definitely have seen a lot of e bikes there. The company that I bought my my latest e-bike, I just asked them for data because I was putting together this presentation for, for what I'm doing next week. And they were more than happy to provide me with everything I needed. And they tell me that they have a huge market in Europe. Uh, of course, you know, a Amsterdam is a pretty big one, but they have markets everywhere, right? And over there, it's, you're seeing them being used in the cities or being used in the suburbs or being used in the countryside. And, and so, so everywhere your bikes are being used, you're seeing e-bikes now, and then they're being used a lot by uh, people that are that are approaching that age where where they were losing that mobility, but now with a bike that's got a power assist or pedal assist, they are now basically it's it, it's like a second chance, at, you know, at getting out there and riding. So 
It is nice, I think. And, and even the AARP had, had a whole article on that uh, recently, right? As far as like regaining your your mobility and your access to like the great outdoors or or, or keeping up with your grandchildren and sort of thing when they ride bike. <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, you know, you know, uh, I'm I'm thinking of Joe Biden for a mo moment and Kamala Harris, you know, trying to um, bring manufacturing back to the U.S. make you know, the U.S. manufacturing hub. And one obvious possibility is e-bikes. Right. Um, of course, e-cars e too, although I, I right. read last week that uh, I think the General Motors is cutting back on its uh, yeah. electric vehicles, which is uh, sort of sad. Um, but <clears throat> e-bikes could be a great manufacturing possibility for the U.S., and uh, it, it allows for small businesses. It allows for, mm -hmm. um, you know, creative technology that, that has has yet to be developed. Where are we on that? Are these bikes you're talking about the ones you really like? You mentioned uh, like Panasonic, just for example. Batteries. Um, that, that uh, okay. Uh, the question is whether there's a possibility, whether it's actually happening, that the United States is manufacturing these things and and doing well at it, or whether we are going to lose that option to other places. Well, most e-bikes now, the really good ones, are they're not made here. They're made in China. There's a couple of them that are made in Europe. Uh, for example, there's a brand called the Bafang, which that makes the majority of the motors, the e-bike motors, and they dominate that market. But then there's also Bosch, which is the German brand. They also make, make, you know, make a, a lot of the European bikes. Then there's, a, I believe it is a Yamaha that it's Japanese and, and and they make their own type of motors. So, you know, they they all are pretty competitive with each other and both in quality, price and availability. So so it, it all depends on the market. I do know, for example, that here in the US, they did, they recently, well, they imposed it a while back, but they took forever to enforce it. Now they finally have applied it. And so there's a 30% there's a tariff, import tariff on e-bikes coming in from China. Which is why, at the same time, they give you a 30% tax credit <laughs> for a bike you buy. Now, if you buy a bike that has been assembled here, or a bike that was sitting in inventory here for a long time, then I think you 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 make out very well. But I think ultimately that's really to to incentivize the manufacturing of bikes, or at least the assembling of bikes here, even if it's got some foreign components. If you manufacture it here, I, I think that's part of that incentive to incentivize that. So so yeah, yeah there. Yeah, there is a push for it. I've seen it, right? Like Cannondale, for example, attract those are American brands, but they're really investing heavily on, on, on building bikes here in the U.S. So, no, so because you know, if you have more people riding bikes, any kind of bikes, uh, and especially e-bikes, because that will appeal to a larger a larger market. Yeah. Um, but um, what you have then is you have a political pressure on, on municipalities. To build infrastructure to accommodate them, oh yeah, and to to make rules that will properly regulate them and so forth. So, um, we we need to have a, a, an American industry for a lot of reasons. Oh, I so we're uh, just about out of time, uh, Guillermo. Uh, do you have some wrap up comments, some advice uh, for the public about how to deal with this? Well, I'm seeing as as we all age and. Uh, a lot of a lot of my peers, a lot of your peers, I imagine as well, are probably going to look at this as a as not first it becomes a toy recreational, and then eventually it becomes something they actually use quite a bit. They want to ride to the store, they want to ride to you know down to an appointment, they want to ride around town, and rather than taking their car out, right? And you, you're going to see more and more of these bikes. I think the best approach here is, is to get involved. And learn more about them. Uh, remember, if you try, if you if you're opposed to something, you may limit yourself to its utility later on. So it, it's just important to actually get more educated in what they are. Um, at the same time, right? It's it's um, well, those of us that can still ride regular bikes and and we have an opposition to them. I mean, you got to remember, right? Not everybody has the same physical ability or same level of fitness than these seasoned young writers, which, you know, I, I once was there, you were there at some point, I'm sure. And then now we get to the point where it's like, hey, listen, our our parts are hurting. So we need a little bit of help. So so they're coming now from the grid perspective, right? Uh, that's gonna be a considerable amount of load at some point to charge them. But I think at some point, you know, 
maybe maybe after that they manage all the EVs that, as a distributor energy resources, you're gonna be you're gonna see something where 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 they're gonna be providing a little bit of power to the grid somehow, and it's gonna be that even much more granular right uh, input. So it's coming. Uh, may not be here right away, but it'll be here. So. Yeah, I can see it now. With, with every bike that you buy, you get a solar panel to charge it, trickle yeah. charge, if you like, overnight. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Guillermo Sabache, HSI. Thank you. thank you for joining us. Thank you for this discussion. I'm your host, Jay Fidel, and thanks for watching. Aloha. <laughs>